Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Secrets of Scotland Yard with your host and narrator, Clive Brook. Brought to you by the Mutual Broadcasting System in cooperation with the Kraft Foods Company, makers of Velveeta, the quality pasteurized processed cheese spread. x um... How do you do? What would make you commit a murder? What motive? Love? Hate? Jealousy? Greed? Murders by madmen don't count. They have no motive. But quite sane people have destroyed human life for reasons both extraordinary and unpredictable. How interesting and exciting are the vagaries of human nature. In proof of which, I'm going to recall to life a little scene of murder that happened at a certain place and to certain people. And I want you to guess the motive. The certain place was a public house, and the certain people, two men and a woman. <laughs> Look, Bill, there's Mary Haldane. I haven't been seen in around the old haunts lately. Certainly it is that I've never set my eyes on her at this time of day. She usually is sleeping during the light hours. I'm thinking she looks none too happy. Uh, what do you think of her for, uh, you know? She's by the right type. I don't think she'd be missed. Let's try her out. Ah, well now, Mary Miguel. You're out very early today, are you not? Early? Late? Makes no difference when you're only half alive. Closing time, gentlemen! Hey, come to think of it, Mary. You're looking a bit under the weather now. You've not been drinking, have you? Uh, that's just it. This is my first, and it looks like being the last. I'm sober as a saint and very, very sorry for it. What in the name of heaven will it be then that's making you so unhappy? Money, Bill. Money. Haven't any. Ah, oh, well, no. I'm thinking a wee dram of the finest refreshment in the world. It would be doing you no harm at all, Mary, now. Come along with us to Bill's house. We were just going to have a drop ourselves now. Oh, thank you, gentlemen, thank you. I'm just dying for a drink. You never know how much you love the stuff until you haven't got the money to buy it. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. You've probably saved my life. Oh, do you think he's given me so much already? Oh, oh, oh well then, <laughs> just one more. <laughs> oh, that's good. The taste seems to get better and better and better. <laughs> ah, come along now, Mary. Just one more now. This one will taste better than all the others put together. Oh, no, no really? <laughs> oh, well, I'm finding myself getting a bit dizzy, you know. I don't think I'd better have any more. She's <laughs> really sozzled. Now's the time. Get that pillow quick. What was that? Is that food? Uh, drink, Mary. Just a little drink, you know. Uh, just another little drop of the pretty shine in your lovely oh, eyes now. <laughs> oh, Bill. Uh, you and your compliments. <laughs> You'll be the death of me. <laughs> Quick now. Over her mouth and nose. <laughs> I got a leg. It won't be long now. <laughs> I think it's all over now. Can you hear her heart? Just a second. Yes. It's still beating. It's fainter. I can hardly hear it now. Yes, it stopped. And now, what was the motive for that murder? A murder deliberately planned and executed. What was the motive? The woman had no money. She'd done nothing to call for revenge. The murderers certainly neither loved nor hated her. What could they gain from her death? What did they want from her? Well, they wanted her dead body. <laughs> If you have high blood pressure, here are good reasons to stay on your medication. There are people around who need you so. They shower you with love just to let you know. They want you to be there to see their dreams come true. But you won't be there if you don't take care of you. Do it for them. Son and your daughter. Yourself. Do it for all the loved ones in your life. Don't let
let high blood pressure lead to a stroke, kidney, or heart failure. Treat it and live. Stay on your daily medication, if not for yourself, for them. service of this station and the Advertising Council. We open our story in November 1827 in Edinburgh, Scotland. There, in a filthy retreat called Tanner's Close, situated in the lowest quarter of the city, there existed a tramp's lodging house. The terms were not exorbitant, Threepence per person per night. But the fact that the hovel only contained eight beds did not mean that only eight lodgers were accommodated. They usually slept two or three in a bed. The landlord was an Irishman, William Hare. In the house as a paying guest was another Irishman, William Burke, with his girlfriend, Helen MacDougall. As Burke and Hare were friendly, so did friendship spring up between Mrs. Hare and Miss MacDougall. Now for the story. On this particular evening, Hare came into Burke's room in an obviously angry mood. Hello there. Ah, evening to you here. And what is it I can be doing for you? Oh, I was just dropping in for a spot of talk and perhaps a spot of spirit. Ah, yes, yes. I was just having a dram myself. Ah, there's nothing to touch it. That's true enough. One could buy a lot of whiskey with four pounds now, couldn't one? And why four pounds? Now then, come on with you. Uh, what is it you'll be having on your mind? Well, it's this way, Buck. That old man, Donald. Ah, there, me pensioner upstairs, uh, who's always having them nightmares. Uh, he'll be having no more nightmares. He's dead. Is he, by the saint? And when? Yesterday morning. Ah, well, now. But what's there in an old man dying off to worry you? He had to die sometime. Uh, you didn't have a hand in it yourself, now, did you? Lord, no. He died of too much drinking and old age. I wanted him to stay alive. The old codger, he owed me money. Uh, that'll be the four pounds you mentioned. Yes, and he's left nothing. Not a farthing. Ah, that's bad. Bad indeed now. I'm terribly sorry here. Burke, I've been thinking now. There might be a way of, uh, so to speak, retrieving the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, a relation? No, no, he had none to my knowledge. Would you be knowing of a Dr. Monroe? He's a lecturer at the medical school. Ah, I've heard his name somewhere now. He lectures to the students on anatomy or some such name, and he shows them what he's driving at in his talk by pointing it out on a body, a dead body. He cuts up the body while he's talking to them. Ah, go on here now. But what's this got to do with old Donald upstairs? Dr. Monroe is short of bodies right now. He pays well for them, and no questions asked. He usually gets them from the students who rob the graves of the dead up at the church. But you'd be wanting to sell him old Donald without having to put the corpse in the grave at all. Right. Will you be helping me? I need help in this. Uh, what will I be getting out of it? Anything over the four pounds that Donald owes me. I'm with you then. Where's the body? In the coffin in the yard. We'll stuff the box with a bag of wood, then nail the lid back on. No one will know it isn't a corpse inside when they come to bury it. Let's get on with it, then. The idea was a variation on the old one of body snatching. The robbing of graves had been going on since early in the previous century. The dissecting tables of the medical schools were kept supplied mainly by bands of such thieves who would rob the nearby churchyards at a good profit. If you've ever been to Edinburgh, you will perhaps have noticed the cage-like effect of certain cemeteries, the graves being fenced in with iron bars. These are relics of an age when the sleep and peace of the dead were liable to be disturbed by the resurrectionists, as they were called. Sometimes the robbers would keep a watch over the aged and ailing members of the community, waiting for death to do its work. And then, almost before the body was stiff in its grave, they would dig it up and take it to the nearest market, in other words, the nearest medical school. It was illegal, of course, and the strict Scots religion made the crime very unpopular. But all this tended to make the price of bodies higher, and though the risks were great, so were the profits. And this must be the door, number ten. That's right. Well, there's someone about anyway. Should be bargain, do you think? Ah, better not the first time. Uh, let's hear what they have to offer. If he pays enough to cover Donald's debts to you and, uh, and a bit more for me, I'll be content. Well, I wish he'd hurry up. I don't like carrying a corpse all over Edinburgh with me. Shh. Ah, can I help you, gentlemen? Uh, we've come to see Dr. Knox. Well, I'm afraid he's busy at the moment. 
Can I help you? No, you can trust me. Well, now, we have this... Uh... Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Come inside. <coughs> Put it down on this table. That's right. Now then, take it out of the sack. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm afraid I can't offer you more than seven pounds. Seven pounds, is it? Oh, all right then. Seven pounds ten, but no more. Now, here you are. Oh, thank you kindly, sir. In a moment, we'll return to the secrets of Scotland Yard with your host, Clive Brook. These days, we're hearing a lot about productivity. And it's easy to see why. Because if our country can manage to make a little more out of our natural, financial, and human resources, we can slow down inflation, strengthen our economy, and make our jobs more secure. Sounds like a politician's dream, doesn't it? Well, it's more practical than you might think. Because what it takes is not muscle, but ideas. Ideas on how to do a job a little better. Ideas on how to make a piece of steel go a little further. Ideas on how to make crops grow a little better. And America is strong on ideas. So if you can use your ingenuity to do your job a little more productively, do it. And encourage others to do the same. America has always worked best when we all work together. This message from the National Center for Productivity and Quality of Working Life, brought to you by the Ad Council and this station. Among the lodgers at the establishment of William Hare was a miller named Joseph. How's that, uh, how's that fellow Joseph getting on? He was coughing all last night. I couldn't sleep a wink on his account now. Oh, he's worse. And his fever's alarming the other lodgers. Bad for business, you know. Some of them will be leaving unless he gets better soon. Better or worse? Much worse. Eh? Let's go and see him. We might be able to put the poor devil out of his suffering. And uh, Hare... I'm thinking Dr. Knox might be getting a wee bit anxious about bodies for his lectures. Are you with me? Yes. Joseph would be better off dead anyway. Has he uh, any relations that might be worried about him? Not that I know of. Here's the door. Now wait till I say the word and then move quickly. We don't want him making an unholy row. Hold on. Half shares when we sell the body. Of course, of course, man. What did you think? Come in. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening to you, Joseph. And how are you feeling tonight? Oh, Mr. Barker, having along for this world, I fear. Not long. Now, what do you think here? Not long, I fear. Quick now, put the pillow over his mouth. I'll hold his legs. I've got you. Now, this time we have many... In Burke's later confession to an Edinburgh evening paper, he winds up this particular episode with the words, Sold to Dr. Knox for ten pounds. About nine months after the first murder, that of Joseph the Miller, an ex-soldier and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Gray, were staying at the lodging house. One evening, there was a party given by Burke in his room, to which all the lodgers were invited. Burke gave the party in honor of a little old woman he had found in a wine shop. Mr. and Mrs. Gray were among the guests. Would you believe it now? There I am having my morning drama whiskey in old Rhymer's shop. When what would I be hearing but a gentle voice speaking in accents of my own beloved Ireland? Asking for arms, she was. No, Mrs. Gray, would I be the true son of the fairest land in all the world if I were not asking you to take a little refreshment at my expense? Uh, and as sure as my name's William Burke, what would you think I would be finding her name was? I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Burke. I'm sure I don't know. Why, Doherty. Doherty. The same as my darling mother's name. God rest her soul. Uh, and would it be right now? I'm asking you, Mrs. Gray, if I were not to be throwing a bit of a party tonight for the sake of a dear relation of mine. Uh, very kind of you, Mr. Burke. But you know, thinking your dear relation is a wee up too much of the whiskey. She's old now and, and none too steady in her feet. Oh, Billy Hare will be taking care of her. He's dancing with her now. 
Oh, look now, if he hasn't trampled on her feet. Oh, she doesn't look too badly up to me. Uh, no, no, probably just a sprain. Now, are you all right, my dear Maggie? Oh, Mr. Burke, I'm not hurt, Fred. But I'm afraid there'll be no more dancing for me tonight. <laughs> Nor any other night. The party continued drunken and noisy into the small hours. Mr. and Mrs. Gray left comparatively early, but returned on Hare's invitation to breakfast the next morning. Came the old lady. You had me last night. Uh, Doherty, do you mean? Ah, the old hag. Did you not hear the row in here all night? She got so drunk she thought she was 50 years younger and started getting much too friendly with me. Uh, we kicked the silly old baggage out of the house. Well, well, that's so bad. That's the truth I'm telling you, Mrs. Gray. I put up with the old girl as long as I could, but we had to get rid of her in the end. Oh, what a row she made. <laughs> but, but she's quiet enough now, Mrs. Gray. Mm. Uh, keep away from mm. that bed, if you please, hey. now. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burke. I wanted to get to the potatoes. They're under here, aren't they? Ah, oh, what in the name of mercy are you doing near the bed with the lighted pipe in your mouth now? Come away, do you hear? Uh, what's my pipe got to do with it? Ah, wait, woman. You might, uh, you might set the straw on fire with it, uh, and then there'd be a nice mess now. I'll get the potatoes myself, uh, and I'll warn everybody to keep away from this part of the room. This peculiar conduct naturally aroused the curiosity of the Greys, but it was not until nearly evening that Burke left the house, by which time Mrs. Gray must have smoked several more pipes. As soon as Burke left, she went straight to the bed, lifted the cover, and there she discovered the dead body of Mrs. Doherty. It is due to the unswerving honesty of Mrs. Gray and her husband that the criminals were brought to justice. Both Burke and his mistress tried to bribe them to keep quiet about their discovery. They were poor people, and the offer of ten pounds a week must have been very tempting, but they went to the police. And gradually the whole horrible story came out. Though it was not until much later, when Burke made his confession, that the public learned the full extent of the crime that had been committed in Tanner's Close. For the moment, only the murder of Mrs. Doherty was before them. But was it murder? The first job of the public prosecutor was to prove this, to establish what in Scots law is called the corpus delicti. But owing to the subtlety of the murderer's methods, the surgeon of the Edinburgh City Police was unable to say whether the old woman has really died from violence. The evidence against all four concerned was inadequate, and at one time it looked as though it would be a case of having no trial. But finally, as all four still denied all accusations against them, it was decided that Hare should be asked to turn King's evidence. Hare readily accepted the offer. He came into the court with a ghastly smile. William Hare, we observe that you are at present a prisoner in the toll booth of Edinburgh, and from what we know, the court understands that you must have had some concern in the transaction now under investigation. It is therefore my duty to inform you that whatever share you might have had in that transaction, if you now speak the truth, you can never afterwards be questioned in the court of justice. These words must have reassured him greatly. He implicated himself and his partner Burke with every word he spoke, knowing all the time that only Burke would pay the penalty. The case started at 10 a.m. on December the 24th, 1828, and the court sat without a break until 9.30 the next morning, Christmas Day, when the verdict was returned. Burke's mistress, MacDougall, was acquitted, as the charge against her was not proven, which is a Scots compromise between guilt and innocence. Hare's wife went free, as his evidence could not concern her. Wife cannot bear witness against husband. But William Hare himself went free seems unjust to us now, but at the time it was a case of one or neither, and the course taken was the only possible one within the law. I would like you all to hear the sentence passed on Burke. It was the normal one for murderers in Scotland, but it had, I think, a special significance when applied to a man who made his living by the sale of corpses to the medical school. And upon that day, to be taken forth from the said toll booth to the common place of execution in the lawn market of Edinburgh, and then and there to be hanged by the neck by the hands of the common executioner upon a gibbet until he be dead, and his body thereafter to be delivered to Dr. Alexander Munro, Professor of Anatomy in the University of Edinburgh, to be by him publicly dissected and anatomized. And may God Almighty have mercy on your soul. And so it was that William Burke ended up in the same way as the numerous men and women that he and his fiendish partner had smothered to death on a lecturer's dissecting table. No 
face is lovelier than the face that emerges from a pink ice Hot and cold money. The money it costs all of us to keep our homes cool in summer and warm in winter. To save some money and help conserve our precious energy resources, here's some good advice. The amount of energy necessary to heat or cool your home is greatly affected by your insulation. Good insulation keeps furnace heat inside in winter and the sun outside in summer. If it's faced with foil, it'll serve as a barrier against moisture vapor. Aluminum-faced insulation aids in retarding heat flow, and proper insulation can make large savings in money and energy. A properly insulated roof can save 90% of heat loss compared to an uninsulated roof. Good insulation can save a considerable amount of heat loss through walls and floors, not to mention the benefits of insulated aluminum siding. In hot weather or cold, a properly insulated house will be comfortable and economical. The Mutual Broadcasting System has presented The Secrets of Scotland Yard with your host and narrator, Clive Brook. In cooperation with the Kraft Foods Company, makers of... This is Sanford Marshall inviting you to return next week when we will again reveal the secrets of Scotland Yard.